and then, as the mist parted, I did my laundry. First socks, then pants, then shirt. It was, I recall, a difficult combat. The shirt wouldn't unbutton properly, and the river was cold. But in the end I triumphed, and yes, I now have clean underwear. Hello, my name is Guy, and today we're going to be looking at what is RPG? What is a role-playing game, and how is this going to affect us? Welcome to the first circle as we uh, explore and unpack fundamentals of how to be a great GM. So, today we're going to be discussing entertainment, escapism, success, and socialization. Now, a lot of people don't necessarily think success or escapism or social, they don't think that these are important for role playing, and they don't think that they're important for us to understand as game masters how they work. And it really, really is a basic building block. If you can work out and keep these four things, these four goals, as part of your design strategy as a, a game master moving forward, you can't go wrong. So, entertainment should be had. We, we, we should be entertained by these games. If we're not entertained by these games, something's gone wrong and we need to fix it. If it's not fun, really, we shouldn't be doing it. This is optional. There's no, no one, hopefully, holding a gun to your head saying, you must roleplay. This should be fun. If it's not fun, we need to figure out why, and we're going to use some of these tools to understand that. So, why should it be fun? How do we make it fun? We make it fun with emotional investment. If we don't care, if we do not care as the game master or as the players in our characters or in the game, it's not fun. We won't follow along. It's like asking somebody, here we go, please read this book. It's on um, mechanical engineering of a 1920s automobile uh, with half the pages missing. Uh, enjoy it. Really enjoy it. Sink your teeth into it. It's a good read. If it's not something that you care about, you're not going to have fun. So we need to make sure that our players and our GM, us ourselves included, are emotionally invested. How are we going to do that? I'm going to talk about that later on. The important thing is to realize that if people aren't having fun, if they're not invested, it's not going to be interesting. Pacing. Pacing, pacing, pacing. This is a tricky one, and we're going to be talking about this through first circle, second circle, and third circle, because it gets more complicated as you try to do it more accurately. Pacing is about whether the game is going quickly or slowly, or quickly or slowly. For first circle, all you need to worry about is fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. Get that right, and you are golden. Now, what do I mean by fast? What do I mean by slow? What do I mean by fast? What do I mean by slow? Fast is where the pace of the game is moving quickly, and the characters have to make decisions quickly. They have to really keep up. They really need to move forward. In other words, you put a time pressure on the amount of time the characters can take to make decisions. This should not last. It should slow down to where the point to the point where the characters have got as much time as they like to make decisions. They can talk, they can discuss, they can plan, they can prepare. And then we need to go back to where there is no decision making and it's just a react, 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 react. So in other words, pacing is about reaction and then action, reaction and then action, action of planning, relaxing. All those kinds of things, they might sound like they're, they're aggressive things. They're not necessarily. They're where the players are in charge and where the players aren't in charge. We need to remember that. Narrative structure. Now, we're going to unpack narrative structure in almost every video that we're going to be uh, doing this year. So narrative structure in this sense, if you don't have narrative structure, if you're just going in any kind of direction and uh, things happen, it might work for a little while. It might work for a one-shot or for a session. And a one-shot is where you only have one adventure. Uh, once off, you get together, you play for a couple of hours, and then that's done. No expectations moving forward. You might get, get by with that for a while. On the other hand, after a while, it's not going to feel as if there's any point. 
Narrative structure allows us as players, as participants, as game masters to expect, to anticipate what's coming up. If we can anticipate what's coming up, well, that's absolutely brilliant because when it happens, we get the sense that, oh, well, I already worked it out. I knew it was going to happen. That's what we want. We want the players and yourself, by the way, to be able to anticipate, well, the story is kind of going in this direction. This then happened. I knew it was coming because I could anticipate it. On the other hand, when it doesn't happen, it happens later. It's like, whoa, that was a surprise. That's brilliant. I want that. That is our ultimate goal. If there is no structure, the player's going, oh, I don't know what's happening next. I don't know what's coming up next. Oh, I don't really. Oh, that happened. Okay. All right, let's deal with that. So do you see how giving us a narrative structure gives us a specific sense of purpose? Aha! So someone wants something badly by a specific time and is having difficulty guessing it using a certain force. It's the fundamental sentence that this almost entire channel is based upon and something that you should devote your life to understanding. Someone wants something, something, that object is what they're after by a certain time. Time puts pressure on that someone to get the thing that they are after. They are having difficulty achieving it. Why? That is usually the players or the players are having difficulty because of the enemy and they are using what? Whether they're using Force, whether they're using Nazgul, whether they're using Ringwraith, it doesn't matter. The whole idea is that this fundamental sentence is the very building block around which everything will be constructed. Someone is having difficulty getting something by a specific time using a certain force. It's a very, 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 very simple thing. Someone wants something by a specific time and badly and is difficulty having... Wait, I line, line. What's the line again? Uh, thank you, Professor. We're going to unpack that even more later on. We continue, though, with what is an RPG? Escapism. Escapism, 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 all isms, escapism, escapism is about us getting away from it all for a little bit. Whether it's on holiday, whether it's into the fields of Mordor, it doesn't matter. Escapism, escapism, I'm going to have fun with that word. Escapism is about consistency of immersion. So when you dive into the world of Harry Potter and you're escaping into that space, you're in Hogwarts, you're encountering amazing professors and things like that. When suddenly a spaceship comes out of nowhere, the consistency has fallen away and the immersion breaks and we're no longer escaping from our real world worries. Now we have new worries. Why has this happened? Why is our game broken? Why is the consistency gone? So consistency is important and consistency here refers specifically to the environment in which we have created. Remember our fundamental statement is that it is an imaginary world created by the game master. You are creating that world, whether you're pulling it from somebody else's sources, like say Star Trek, for example, or you are creating your own world, the consistent application of that space, the promise that you have given of this space needs to be maintained at almost all costs. So when consistency is broken, Oftentimes you'll find that that's when players suddenly disengage. That's when they suddenly get bored. So if your consistency breaks, you need to bring it back. Oh, it was a dream sequence, that alien spaceship. It was a dream. It was an important of the future. It doesn't matter. You've got to bring back that consistency. Alternative worlds were good triumphs. Good triumphs. So often in real world, we have plans. Oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. And then life happens and causes the whole thing to fall apart. Or there's an injustice or there's something that just happens and you go, why? I hate this is so unfair or this is this or this. We don't want to go into a space. We don't want to escape into a space that does exactly the same thing. We want there to be this opportunity for the right thing, for justice, for for good to triumph. We need that to make ourselves feel a little bit better. That yes, today in real life is terrible, but maybe, maybe tomorrow will be better because 
Well, in the dark space, we slew the dragon. It came back, but we defeated it through teamwork. So maybe that will help me get through to this real world. People forget that. That's a big responsibility. As entertainers, as people who are having fun, it's a big responsibility on us is to allow the fact that there should be heroes. Power. Escapism is also about power. I choose to leave real world and go somewhere else because there I have power. If I choose to escape into a computer game as a classic example, I have complete power. I can delete the character. I can restart the story. I can save here and try an option and then come back again. The power is in my hands. My escapism, part of this getting away from the real world, is that I can make decisions where the ramifications have no meaning other than the meaning that I give them. And I can just redo them over and over again. Now, in role playing, obviously, once you've made a decision, there hopefully will be consequences. And it's your job as the game master to give those consequences to the player's characters when they do do things that require a consequence. However, they had the choice to make that decision and you should be giving the power to them to change to correct, to do right, to realize that the good will triumph. And yes, although they did this thing, which in real life would get them sent to prison for 20 years without parole, we can change. We're good triumphs. There's a consistency to our world where heroes are recognized. It's very, very important. Very, very important. And <sighs> Demonos... I see very often GMs becoming bound by rules rather than their own creativity and the players' characters, of course. We must forget that there are things in this world that we have no control over. That's why we're here. We're escaping for a reason. Don't become the reason why your players want to escape from your own world. Allow the monsters and the NPCs and all of the wonderful creatures that are crawling and scurrying and lurking about to work towards creating a space in which the players want to return constantly. That's our goal, is to escape from the mundane and the ordinary, where things are predictable and things happen. Uh, but at the same time, our control must be absolute and must be consistent. Don't forget that little word of his, consistency. You control the thoughts, the reactions, and the emotions, or the emotions of all of the creatures and beings in your world. Use that as a tool. Never forget, you are not constrained by what you have said before. You can alter and adjust as needed as long as you can explain that before they were having a bad day, or uh, mind control, or they were in love, or something along those lines. Whatever it is that you truly desire, you can make happen as long as you can justify it before or after the fact. <laughs> Can't argue with that. Success versus outcome. Now, we spoke about good triumphing over evil. We spoke about the choice of power. Where does that come from, though? That comes from moderation. It comes from the game master. It comes from you making sure that the players succeed... But there is an outcome, there is justice, and there is meaning to behind that. So often in real world, something happens and there's no meaning behind it. A plane full of people vanishes and no one can find them. Where's the meaning? Where's the justice? There isn't any. There's that frustration that just lingers. In our world, we have a game master. You, in your creative world, you are in charge of everything. So you can moderate. You can adjust. You can change. And for me... If you take one thing away from this video, one thing away from First Circle, it's that you are in command, you are in charge, you are the ultimate moderator. So even if the rules say something, you have the power to change it. And if that means that it's going to allow for success and for justice and for meaning to occur, that is a good use of moderation and, and, and making sure that everything in this whole RPG works. 
moderating the space. It's your world. Do not be constrained by rules, by physics, by real world stuff. We're escaping from all of that for a reason. It must be consistent, of course. That's why I put all of these things in one video. Consistency, but moderation. So I hate dead ends. Dead ends where the players go, we have no idea what to do. Nothing. Nothing coming to mind. No choices. No options. Uh, shall, we, shall we play bridge? No. Dead ends are the result of you as the game master not moderating, not bringing meaning, and not bringing justice to the characters' worlds and therefore the players' worlds, which gets them out of the game because they're no longer interested, because they can't solve it, because it's too tough, because it's more like real life, and so we're no longer escaping. We're now stuck in this horrific space where we don't know what we're to do. So dead ends are very bad. That gives us the power to use this yes, but no, and. It's a powerful sentence. It's a powerful statement. Learn it. You get to the bar. You took too long to get there, but it's okay because there's someone else that I have added there. I have moderated the world so that we have justice and meaning who has the same information. Why? Because I have all of the power because I am the game master. That is something you must remember. So yes, 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 you get to the bar, but... The person is dead. However, there is someone else. It's not a dead end, quite literally and figuratively. Or no, and. No, you don't get to the bar. And somebody else has got information that you need, but you know about them. Never use a dead end. Yes, but no, and. Burn that into your memory. So many things you have to burn into your memory for this video. 70% chance of survival. Sir Ival uh, was a famous knight, Sir Ival of uh, Chalice. Uh, very, very famous. Uh, uh, there should be a 70% chance of Sir Ival arriving uh, in any moment. Survival. 70% chance survival. This was said by Gary Gygax in his book Master of the Game, which he wrote a very long time ago and which was hugely influential in how pretty much everybody runs their games these days. 70% chance of survival for the PCs, but it should only feel like 30% chance. It should only feel like 30% chance. In other words, success, justice, meaning, moderation, yes, no, no, dead ends. There should always be a 70% chance of success, survival, with a 30% chance. It should feel like this 30% chance. So it should feel as if, oh, this is the world's going to end. All of this is going to come. It's over. It's over. Oh, my goodness. But actually, actually, you've got it all in your hand because you are the moderator. You are the one with the power and you are making sure that everyone is having fun. Justice and meaning. Very, very important. But don't take it from me, Mr. Cheese. Well, well look, it's, it's very obvious. Every, every piece of literature that's out there states very clearly suggestions, advice, guidelines, not hard and fast rules. Now, obviously, everything has to obey by a rule, a law. Uh, there has to be consistency. Otherwise, it's just chaos. And why bother playing? <laughs> I mean, really, why bother playing? So whatever rule system you want to use, whatever numbers, whatever fanciful values, 70, 30, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. You have to apply it consistently across the board. So when it comes to something like this, when it comes to moderation, when it comes to, to yes, no, dead ends and, and, and that sort of thing, you've got to have your own rules in your head. Yes? Okay, good. Following? Good? Right? Yes? <laughs> okay, so own rules, stick to them. Make sure the players know about them, because otherwise it's not fair. You can't have rules in your head and no one else knows about it. It's very important. Can't stress it enough. Cannot stress it enough that everybody knows what's going on. Everybody's on the same page, even if the rules are different from the rules that are written, although those are really written with a lot of care and attention. So you probably should work those work those into it somehow. I mean, that's, that's why you're using them in the first place. Um, but yes... <laughs> structure comes from having a common reference point. We need to make sure that there is a common reference point. Otherwise, no one knows what's going on. What? Okay. Socialization. 
Lots and lots of people play this game because it allows them to have an excuse to go and see friends, to spend time with the buddies. It's the game night. It is the thing that we do because it is the thing that we have done and it brings us into a happy space. There is nothing wrong with that. There is no reason why we shouldn't continue to do it. However, we need to make sure that we do it with the right people. This is a question I would say possibly the most asked question that I have ever encountered. Uh, we have a player at the table who sucks. How do we get rid of them or how do we make them better? This is the tough one. And if only, if only everybody knew this fundamental rule, I would say it's a rule, this fundamental would make lives a lot easier. Make sure whoever you are playing with fits culturally. Culturally. What does that mean? Now, don't worry, Battenborough is not going to come running through. Culturally, we mean timekeeping. Are there someone who's going to arrive on time or consistently be late? Are there some, going to be someone who arrives drunk or high or going to sponge food off of everybody or going to sit at the table and talk on their cell phone to a beloved one or not? Are they the type who like to interrupt games and not really focus on the games? Are they the type who are really there for a good time and if d, &D happens or if role playing happens, it happens and if it doesn't happen, they don't care either way? None of these are bad, by the way. Someone who talks on their cell phone at the table, someone who arrives late, someone who's wanting to imbibe alcohol or to participate in legal drug-taking activities, all those kinds of things. Those are absolutely fine activities. And if your entire group is culturally aligned to that, fine, that's your group. If, however, you are not aligned to that, there's nothing you can do to change unless you want to quite literally go through the whole process of life again we are who we are if you arrive on time you arrive on time and when someone does not arrive on time you will always perceive it as being the greatest insult to existence ever because they do not perceive you to have value in their lives because they're willing to arrive late for you although they will claim that that is not the actual case <clears throat> <laughs> So, a cultural fit. Making sure that the people that are sitting around the table have the same basic fundamental philosophies about socializing that you do. Very important. Mechanically, this is a critical thing. Now, we don't really have a comparison when you show up for a tennis match. It's assumed everyone's going to be playing tennis, and everyone's going to be playing tennis with the same set of rules. And there won't be any kind of challenge to that. You're not going to get tennis players who arrive at tennis, who want to play tennis, as if it was interpretive dance, for example. You might, but that's generally not speaking what's going to happen. With role-playing, however, there is a huge difference. There is a huge disparity between the various groups of role players. There are some role players who are mechanics oriented and want to use the rules as they were written, called raw rules as written. Some want to rather interpret the rules. So it's rules as intended, Roy, R-O-I, rules as intended. And then there's some that just use the rule of cool where anything goes as long as it's cool. Uh, so there are many different play styles. We'll unpack those later on as we need to. But for now, it's important to realize that not everyone attends these things with the same intentions. So if you have someone who is far more interested in role playing with the mechanics and building giant heroes of great value that will defeat everything that the GM can throw at them, that's fine. Uh, about making sure, though, that you are in the group that fits your style. If you like the rules and you want the rules to be sacrosanct, you need to find a group who believe the same. If you don't, it simply won't work. So here is the hard truth. Not all fit. We can't play with each other all the time. We cannot adjust. We cannot accept. We cannot. Someone is going to give and usually that will cause friction or tension or disappointment in one way, shape, form or another. It's a hard truth and it's something that we just have to live with. There are, however, options. There are solutions these days that we didn't have when I started playing back way, way back when. Didn't have them. They're very useful tools to allow us to form new groups almost instantaneously with a little bit of help from technology. Major Touchy.
It is a hard fact, but sometimes there is no right fit. Now, many people will talk about the idea that perhaps we can change our natures or we can adapt to the styles of others. I have found in almost 20 years of role-playing this is not the case. We like role-playing for various reasons. We shouldn't deny ourselves those reasons. As a result, what is being said here is absolutely correct. There are a time and place where we must change, and we must embrace that change, for it allows us to make new friends. And that is one of the benefits of role-playing, is that we get to meet people from all over the world who have a similar hobby and a desire to play these games and to have fun while doing it. I can't think of a better unifier than that. So, rather than looking upon the loss of a member or of leaving a group yourself as a bad thing, look upon it as an opportunity for you to find more individuals that you can grow with and understand. Yeah? Huh, always on point. Now, challenge for this week's video for you. Write down the playstyle of each player at the table. So gather your friends around, sit around the table and take a little slip of paper, pen, pencil, blood, whatever you want to use, and write down the name of the player and their playstyle. Now, you might not know what the different playstyles are, so use terms that you think are appropriate. Uh, rules heavy, combat heavy, likes socialising more than playing. Don't be mean. This isn't about being mean. This is about being accurate. Because you're going to swap those notes with each other. Literally, write down the names of the players, write down what you think they are. Once everyone's finished, hand it over. Get the piece of paper from the first person, and you know how this works. I really don't need to explain this. Get the pieces of paper, see what people think your playing style is, and compare it with yourself. Is it really the case? Is it not? And if it isn't, why do you think differently from everybody else at the table? It can be really, really insightful. It allows you to also look at it and go, well, hmm, okay. <laughs> Guess that's why you guys don't invite me around as often as I thought. Because I don't fit with the group. It's a hard truth. There is no right. There is no wrong, as I hope this is made very, very clear. It is simply what it is and it's about adjusting accordingly so rpgs that's them in a nutshell that's what they do for us that's what they allow us to do that's what they inspire us to do that's what they encourage us to do and that's what we should be doing those four aspects are as far as i'm concerned fundamental to understanding how we can play the game before we even start if you agree with me hit that like button if you disagree hit the disagree button but either way i encourage you to leave your comments down below let's share let's talk let's discuss let's understand with one another i read them all i will heart them i'll thumbs up them occasionally when they merit it i suppose one might say but it's about learning from each other because that's the best way to learn as far as i'm concerned of course, uh, if you want more, www.greatgamemaster.com is our main website. It's got links to everything there, our Patreon, where you can get some amazing podcasts and other rewards, and course notes, etc., etc., as well as the various books that we have released on uh, campaign creation and the like. Until next time, however, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming.